the first graphic I wanted to share with you guys uh, was a graphic of a reinforcement learning agent um, playing an Atari breakout video game. And that's an example of uh, a case where standard RL can learn um, in a certain environment very well. But the problem I'll be focusing on is specifically a problem with delayed rewards. And, and this is very relevant to real life because as you um, interact with your environment, you don't typically get points uh, every time you move. There's actions that are separated by very long time scales from their effects. Um, Kathy, would you like me to help you move your slides? Yeah, well, I can't seem to uh, change my screen. My keyboard's not responding to that. I will share them. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, thanks, Francis. And so here's the. Um, I think I might have it. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, OK, can you guys see my screen? My slides? Yes. OK, um, so the plan is going to be uh, three parts. So first I will describe to you why standard RL does struggle in these tasks with long delayed rewards. Um, next, I will describe the temporal reward transport algorithm or TRT that uh, I've been working on to address this problem. And then finally, uh, I will share some results from experiments uh, using TRT. OK, so um, the model in reinforcement learning is you have an agent interacting with the world, and as it interacts, it transitions from state to state, and it can pick up a reward along that uh, trajectory. And so here I have uh, an equation for something called the discounted returns, and this is just the sum of all the rewards that the agent picks up along its trajectory. Um, but there's this extra bit that's uh, added to this returns, and it's this discount factor gamma. And um, this gets at the crux of why standard RL algorithms do struggle with tasks with delayed rewards. The gamma introduces a time scale, um, and it's basically a heuristic that says that you care about rewards now versus later in the future. So you're discounting your future rewards. And so in this plot here, I have an example. If you're standing at time zero and you look forwards 100 time steps, then the reward uh, 100 time steps in the future is discounted by a factor um, so that it's about 37% of its original value. And so this is totally fine if you're in an environment where your immediate actions really just affect the, uh, the most immediate uh, rewards. But in cases with long uh, delays, then it's not going to work as well. And so let's take a look at that. So here's an example we have. Uh, this little guy who is walking through the environment and at some point um, he can choose to pick up a key or not, but he doesn't get a reward for picking up that key. And so this agent continues in, uh, interacting with the environment until the very end it reaches a green goal where if it did pick up the key uh, in that first state, then it's rewarded extra bonus points, 20 points. Um, so the problem with standard RL though is that uh, it wants to reinforce actions based on the, the rewards that were acquired after uh, taking that action. But if we look at the rewards that would wait this particular state action pair where he's next to the key, we'd see the future rewards are highly attenuated. And so there's a very, really low signal and uh, learning is very slow as a consequence. And so what can we do about that? Um, that brings me to the next part of my talk, which is uh, the TRT algorithm. So uh, this algorithm was based on work by Hung from DeepMind um, on optimizing agent behavior over long time scales by transporting value. And the idea is that if you've identified the, signif the significant state action pairs um, that should receive credit for some long term reward, then you can splice those distant rewards to uh, these state action pairs so that you can amplify the signal to reinforce those actions. And so that's what we see here. Um, so in this original situation on the slide, this uh, agent receives zero immediate points for picking up the key. But if we splice in these future rewards, 
uh, in this case, the distal rewards might be 20 points. Suddenly, we have a lot more signal to amplify um, to increase the probability of taking an action in that state, which is what we want. We want the agent to learn to pick up the key. Um, so that brings us to the next question. How do we know what the significant state action pairs are um, in order to receive these spliced rewards, the TRT? Um, so that is the problem of credit assignment and reinforce, uh, reinforcement learning. And um, the way we do that and the way that Hung uh, did it is using an intention mechanism. And so the idea is you do a full rollout of an episode. So the agent interacts with the environment. At the end of that rollout, you pass the entire sequence of states and actions to a model, in my case, a, a binary classifier. And you look at what state action pairs were paid most attention to by uh, the other frames. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so here I have a heat map and this heat map is a plot of the attention scores. And you can see there's these two really bright stripes. Oh, by the way, the axes denote um, the frames in the, the trajectory, both on the X and Y axis. So in this case, there's two really bright stripes and they correspond to highly attended uh, state and action pairs. And if we do a sanity check, we can actually bring up what that particular observation was. We see that it actually uh, makes sense with what we would expect. So in this case, we have an attention and we have an, uh, an agent who's a little red triangle uh, next to a key. So it might be moving forward towards it or trying to pick it up. Um, so this is a good uh, confirmation that we are attending to the important states and actions. So next step is to test out whether this TRT algorithm works. Um, and so I created an environment specifically constructed to make it challenging to learn um, if you don't do credit assignment over long time scales. Uh, in this case, this environment has three phases. Um, in the first phase, the agent is uh, encounters an empty grid with just a single key. And the agent can choose to pick up that key or not, but it doesn't receive any immediate reward if it picks it up. The second phase is a distractor phase. So we fill this distractor phase with gifts. And when the agent opens a gift, it gets immediate rewards. And then the final phase, this is the focus um, of our evaluation, is the phase at which the agent can earn a distal reward. So when the agent navigates to the green goal, if it learned to pick up the key in phase one, it gets 20 points. If it never learned to pick up the key, it just gets five points. So um, that's going to be the focus of the, the rest of the experimental results I'm going to show you. Um, we will focus to see if the agent learns to pick up the key and correspondingly get the 20 points in phase three. Um, so the I have three separate experimental slides I'm going to show you. Um, they all involve varying the parameters of the distractor phase, essentially making it more and more challenging for the agent to learn. Um, and so uh, the three parameters I vary are the time delay, which is the time that the agent is forced to spend in the distractor phase, um, the gift reward size for the distractors, and then also the variance of the distractor rewards. OK, so these plots here uh, show the total rewards that were earned by the agent in phase three to see whether it picked up the key or not. Um, and as you move from left to right, it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, each plot corresponds to um, a certain delay. And so tau of gamma is equal to the discount factor time scale. Um, and we see it increasing from left to right. And so you can see initially when the time delay is not that long, the agent does learn to pick up the key. It doesn't do quite as well as with um, the TRT algorithm on top of the advantage actor critic, the, the baseline is uh, A2C advantage actor critic. Um, but then by the time you get to the uh, rightmost plot, uh, you can see that A2C has basically plateaued at five. And that five points, if you recall, corresponds to only moving to the goal and never really learning to pick up the key. Um, and whereas if you add TRT, it shows consistent progress about learning how to uh, pick up the key. And then the next slide um, is the slide with experimental results for varying the distractor reward size. So again, left to right, it's harder as we increase the size of the distractor rewards. Um, and again, we see the same pattern. Um, A2C with the TRT algorithm does better than A2C alone. And then the final slide uh, was the, the experiment um, showing the last returns uh, in phase three. Um, 
when we vary the variance of the distractor rewards. So in this case, we have four gifts and they all have a mean reward of five. But for each gift, we sample from a uniform distribution around five. And we increasingly, uh, we increase the range of that uh, uniform distribution um, in, in order to uh, increase the variance. Um, and so they all have the same mean reward, but there's just greater variance. And again, you can see um, that A2C plus TRT uh, does better than A2C alone. So to summarize, um, we've seen that adding temporal reward transport on top of uh, standard reinforcement learning algorithms seems to show some benefit for long-term credit assignment. Um, this work has built directly on the ideas from the Hung paper in 2019. Um, and the two core concepts to take away from that are the idea of using some sort of temporal value or reward transport um, to splice on to significant state action pairs, and then to use attention to identify the important state action pairs. Um, so our contribution here has been a completely different architecture implementing these two core concepts. Um, it's much simpler than the original paper's implementation. It's also a much simpler uh, environment, but I think um, there's definitely merits in having sh showing that this concept kind of just carries beyond the original implementation in the paper. Um, the implementation is also very modular. So um, I totally separated out the attention part of uh, this algorithm into a separate classifier um, in order to identify the significant state action pairs. And so you can imagine if you want to try adding TRT to some other model, um, you can do that. It's very easy to add it on because of the modular implementation. Um, so in the future, while well, there's tons of work, there's never ending work, there's always more. Um, this is just a heuristic. And so um, it would be interesting to move beyond just a heuristic, but it's a, a useful heuristic. Um, and also I've only shown you results for a very simple grid world environment. Um, and so it would be interesting to see how well the algorithm can hold up um, in more complex situations. So with that said, I had a lot of fun working on this project. Um, and so I want to um, move on to the Q&A stage, but also I want to uh, sent out my call outs. Uh, so I'd like to thank my mentor, Jerry um, at OpenAI uh, for uh, being with me through this whole process. Uh, I wanted to thank OpenAI itself for this wonderful opportunity and all the different people I've talked to, um, informal, casual conversations. I've picked up so much. Um, thank you to the program organizers, Christina and Mariah have been really wonderful, so supportive of the scholars. Um, and I also have uh, my lovely scholars cohort to thank. They were also very supportive. There was a lot of knowledge sharing as we all um, ramped up on deep learning um, at the same time. Finally, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Square, my employer, for giving me this chance to take some time off to do this program. And then if you're interested in more project details, my write-up is available um, at my blog, efabdb.com. Okay, and then now I'm gonna take a look at um, question So the question is, can you explain why the distractor phase makes the task more difficult? In other words, in your opinion, why does the agent not learn the more general behavior of simply interacting with all objects, picking up the key and opening the gifts? So I think this gets at, with standard RL algorithms, there's this idea that uh, for policy gradients, if you have a policy, which is uh, how you wanna choose an action in a particular state, you can amplify it or reduce the likelihood of doing that, taking that action based on the rewards that follow it. And uh, because of discounting, um, you won't see rewards in the far future. Um, and so in this case, if you are in the key uh, state or in the state in the phase one where you're uh, next to the key, um, it's not going to receive that amplification in that particular state because the rewards in the distractor phase are uh, unique to being in the state next to those distractor gifts. So the agent very quickly learns to open the gifts um, because it sees an immediate reward from the gifts. So that that's that weighting of the reward is very high. 
And so it reinforces this idea of we want to do the toggle action to open the gifts. Um, and so it doesn't just translate uh, that simply just because you've learned that you have to take this particular action in this state, the way the algorithm is set up, it doesn't just translate to learning how to do that um, if you're next to the key. Uh, OK, and the next question is, I am curious to know if using more advanced deep RL algorithms like PPO would weight more than the TRT's influence in the results. Um, I guess so I'm not 100% sure about this wording. It sounds like like what would happen if I had tried it on PPO instead of A2C? Um, and that's a straightforward test we can do because of the modular implementation. Um, but so PPO is more sample efficient than A2C. It is able to do several smaller updates um, compared to one single update by A2C before discarding your batch of experiences. So given that, I would expect it to have a better learning curve. I'm not sure if the interaction with TRT um, would be any different, but I would expect uh, PPO to, to fundamentally look a little better than the baseline that I showed here. I just haven't tested it out yet. What was the most challenging part of your project? Um, oh, there's a lot. Uh, well, so I think at some point when I finally, when I decided on this particular path, I always had a bunch of ideas for how to get it working. And every time I tried something new, a new commit to, to GitHub, I thought maybe this will be it. Um, and so the the challenging part was seeing the, the deadline kind of looming and starting to realize that all my fixes weren't necessar necessarily becoming like the last fix. Um, but then in the end, things worked out when I had like a little, I realized there are some artifacts that were being um, introduced due to the way this algorithm um, is set up. It's very sensitive to the full context of the episodes. And I had to think about how I could handle that because it would have required quite a bit of re-engineering of my code with very little time in order to do parallel training, which is really important. I needed to run this on many workers. Um, and so I, I had an idea to uh, rejigger something. <laughs> well, so, so I'm running out of time, um, but but basically it was just pushing through and it, it, it kind of worked out in the end. So uh, I'm really glad of that. And then so with that, OK, thanks. <laughs>